So silence gives consent. And today what I'm hoping is we can break some silence, even when it's uncomfortable, because I think we want to do important things. What I want you to reflect on is if you or someone you know has experienced one of the following 10 events prior to the age of being 18, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, feeling unloved or unwanted by your family, being afraid your basic needs might not get met, a divorce or separation of your caregivers, witnessing domestic violence in your home, someone with a substance abuse issue or a mental health issue in your home, someone in your home incarcerated, all prior to the age of 18. I've just defined adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, otherwise known as childhood emotional trauma. And it's a health risk that increases social problems in our community, raises our risk for disease, and can even shorten our lifespan. The Center of Disease Control names it as the prime determinant of health. And yet, unlike texting while driving or smoking cigarettes when we're young, for most of us, it's still an unknown epidemic. And yet, 70% of the general population has had at least one of those events happen. That's 1,050 people in this room and about seven people in your row. One out of six of us has had four or more of those events happen. And that's 240 people in this room and probably one or two people in your row. And yet we're not talking about it. Even though when it goes above a four, some pretty hard statistics come about. We're over, at a four, we're over 1,500% more likely to attempt suicide, over 550% more likely to become an alcoholic, COPD, liver disease, asthma. At a six, we're more likely to die 20 years younger than our counterpart, at age 60 instead of age 80. And so we need to embrace what this silent costs us. I want to introduce you to Henry. At 18 months old, Henry moves into your community, and neighbors go to knock on his door, but they hear loud screaming and noise inside, and they look at each other and say, you know, we do crime at watch and checking building maintenance, but I don't know if we're in for this. And so they walk away. At two and a half years old, he goes to daycare, and they notice mom has a bruise on her eye, and Henry's kind of aggressive in class, and they go, director, should we do something about this? No, she says, we're in charge of good quality childcare, not this. And so things go on. At five years old, he's put upstairs in his room and he hears a loud crash downstairs and he comes downstairs and mommy's bleeding on the kitchen floor and dad's standing above her. Four big police officers burst down the door. They grab dad and put him in the police car, grab mom, put her in the ambulance, grab Henry and lock him in the car. A woman comes and taps on his window. She has his things in a garbage bag and says, come on, let's go. He drives to a new neighborhood where he knows no one, falls asleep in a bed, not in his pajamas, crying himself to sleep. He wakes up in the morning going to a new school that he doesn't know, and the teacher yells at him because he has a hard time following the rules, and he says, wow, that sounds like dad, and I don't even know where dad is. And next... He moves from school to school, and his foster care parents get angry at him. And they start yelling at him and begins wetting his bed at night until a new social worker comes and says, come on, put your things back in the garbage bag. we got to move again. And he wonders how many places he's going to have to live, where his parents are, and if he'll see them again. His behavioral health file gets this thick, and so does his school file, until one day they tell him his parents aren't his parents anymore, termination of parental rights. And so now he's up for adoption, but nobody really wants him. And so he's in his 10th foster care placement at 11 years old, and foster dad and foster mom are fighting, and he thinks, I'm never going to watch someone put their hands on someone else again. And he steps in, and he takes a swing, and the next thing he knows, he's in handcuffs in juvenile detention. Now, that's a tough story to hear. And what I want you to think about is 12 systems and 50-plus people crossed Henry and his family's life, and yet no one thought it was their job to connect with them about that hard story. And that doesn't make sense to me, because, right, we're caring people. All of us are. And so I wonder, maybe it's because we were taught it's not our role. It's not our place. Or maybe from a more hidden part of ourselves, we think, that's Henry. That's his family. We can't change stuff like that. That's them, and this is us. What I want you to hear today is this is not an us-them conversation. This is an all-of-us conversation. And if we choose to keep our story of silence... This epidemic's going to grow, and that feels uncomfortable, right? And if I'm doing this right, you feel uncomfortable, because when we get uncomfortable, we grow, and that's a good thing. And you might be saying, Allison, what do you want me to do about this? I mean, 
I don't know how to break this silence. I might not have the right letters behind my name. I might not have any letters behind my name. I mean, violence and abuse, that seems like pretty big stuff. And what I would say to you is this, 70% of why anyone changes a negative health behavior is because of the person who connects with them and inspires them to change that. Relationship is the evidence-based practice. Connection, and you don't need the right letters or any letters to do that. So I wanna tell you about Kat. Kat had eight of those 10 things happen before she was 19 years old. She went from residential, residential placement, about between the ages of 13 and 19, about eight to 10. And she was the kid that broke windows and tore down doors. Sometimes she was held down in restraints and injected with Thorazine. She tells the story of a nurse who one time said, you know what, Kat, act your age, not your shoe size. I own this place. You've got to come through me to get out of here. And that's who Kat would have thought she was until she met Howard, a mental health tech who had no letters behind his name. But he understood connection, and he was willing to go past his role. And he said, you know what, Kat? I get we need to connect and he got, he had to find her motivation. So he took her to the gym and said, you know what, I want you to exercise, and if you give me one solid hour of really good exercise, I'll let you go back to the unit and tell everything, tear everything up. And she said, hell yeah, right? The joke was though that when she walked out of that gym, she was crawling and she couldn't lift a chair to throw, okay? And that was Howard's plan, although she didn't know that. And so Howard looked at her and he said, she began telling these chapters of her story. And he said, you know what, Kat, I see something in you. You're gonna do something important in your life. Well, Kat had never heard that before, and so she liked that. So she did what Howard didn't plan and got locked up a lot to see him. <laughs> that wasn't the intention. And so she came there one day, and he said, Kat, you coming here to see me? And uh, she said, yeah. And he said, here's my schedule, meet me in the lobby. <laughs> right, we don't need to do that. So she did, that's how she got through high school. The thing is, is that hard stuff doesn't happen, stop happening at 18. Kat went away to college, she was raped, she went through a serious suicide attempt, and she came back to the adult psychiatric institution, the same place where she was as a kid. Howard found out she was being admitted, and at two in the morning, he came to her admission and said, Kat, please don't give up before you know what you can become. I'm gonna hold hope right here till you're strong enough to grab it, right here. That was the last time Kat attempted suicide, the last time she was locked in a residential placement, and the first job she ever had was a psych tech on a unit like Howard's because she promised to pay that connection forward. Now, we're sitting here with two stories, and that's the intention. For centuries, stories have taught us how to make meaning. Dr. Brene Brown teaches us that we are hardwired for connection, and that one of our deepest fears is disconnection, that fear of not belonging. And so we're sitting with a story of disconnection and connection. And that gives us a choice. We can think about Henry before he threw that punch, the 12 systems that crossed his path, the 50 plus people that chose not to connect. And we can think maybe if somebody had connected earlier, that story could have been different. And we can think about Kat, because Kat might not be who you think, because Kat's story is my story. My nickname throughout school was Alley Cat. And if Howard had not made a decision to connect with a kid like me, I truly believe I would have been in an institution, dead, or probably in jail. And so we're not powerful enough to know who's had trauma and who hasn't. We're not powerful enough to know who makes it and who doesn't. But we're powerful enough to do two things. One, teach someone else about childhood trauma as a health issue. And two, make that risk of connection. I think about if somebody came up to me and said, you know, Allison, I saw this awesome doctor on Friday talk about childhood trauma, and they told me that I should tell someone about it, and I'm wondering if you would listen. I think I would have listened, and I think it would have made a difference. Mavis Leno once said, if you want to make a difference in the world, the next time you see someone being cruel to another human being, take it personal, because it is. And what I would add to that powerful statement is the next time someone gives you the honor of walking their trauma, their pain story in front of you, answer that call with connection. Because you see, ordinary acts of courage can change this. It's not gonna be the monumental events. Thank you so much for listening to my story.